Thank you, Mike. Greetings one and all and welcome to Beyond the Walls. Our theme today is Prepare a Sanctuary. Our congregation's history in Toronto goes all the way back to 1836 when the branch was first organized. John Taylor served as pastor and he and his wife Phoebe held cottage meetings in their home, which was just a couple blocks west of here, west of where Toronto Centre Place stands today. The Taylors gathered to Nauvoo and John was ordained an apostle. Lacking local leadership, the branch became disorganized and ceased to meet until Elder Joseph Luff and Elder John Shippey returned in the 1870s. They gathered together old saints and baptized enough new converts to reorganize the branch. The congregation was able to purchase a small building on what was then called Arthur Street, now that's known as Dundas Street, in 1877. This was the, first, the, the congregation's first dedicated sanctuary. But when Elder Luff was called away to headquarters to serve in the Council of Twelve, the congregation again became disorganized. It failed to make payments and lost the little building. The current organization of the Toronto congregation began in 1891. According to our records, the branch in its earliest days was composed mainly of young women who came to Toronto from small towns roundabout for work. And as a result, the congregation's nickname was the Old Maids Branch. The core members in the 1890s were Amelia Braden, Prudence Thompson, Millie Bates, Mary Jackson, Minnie and Hattie Osborne, Minnie Wilson, Ella Blair, and Ada Clark. Ada later went on to marry President Joseph Smith III and their son, W. Wallace Smith, seen here uh, at the dedication of the upper sanctuary of the Bathurst Street Church in the 1960s, and grandson Wallace B. Smith later served as presidents and prophets of the church. The branch held cottage meetings in the 1890s in members' apartments and homes, but the worship service and Sunday school quickly outgrew the spaces available to meet. Young women in Canada in the 19th century were usually not well paid for their work, so the congregation collectively was very poor financially. One day, Ella Blair noticed a vacant meat stall in the old St. Andrew's Market on Maud Street, and she thought the space would be sufficient size to house the branch meetings. She went to the city commissioner and was able to rent it for $2 per month which she herself committed to pay. When the other members visited the stall, they were dismayed. One early member later recalled, it was a sight, dirty, filthy, a mess. We were discouraged, but the rent had been paid and we had to take it. We were all so poor that even $2 was quite a sum in those days. We cleaned out the place, we scrubbed it with lime, we painted it with paint that had been donated, and then we had no chairs and no money. <laughs> the girls were earning very little, but somewhere 25 chairs were bought on an installment plan. Now we had chairs, but no table. So we borrowed one from our home. With Brother Shield's help, we secured sufficient lights for the place and later a stove. When it was finished, it was so clean, we thought we were ready for Christ to come. So on that last statement, the branch historian later commented, when one realizes the terrible handicaps under which these early saints labored, we know this is no sacrilegious statement. For out of filth had come cleanliness and out of darkness light. They had prepared a sanctuary. In that converted meat stall on Maud Street, the branch records indicate that John Shields received a revelation that the Toronto Saints were to be not discouraged. Disciples and seekers would come from the east, north, south, and west, and the work would grow. In the subsequent, subsequent 127 years, the Toronto congregation has prepared and dedicated many sanctuaries, including Toronto Centre Place here in 2015. But in recent years, 
Our idea of sanctuary has had to evolve as the Spirit has opened our eyes and minds to new needs and opportunities for ministry. What if the sanctuary we are called to prepare is something much more than any one physical place? As disciples and seekers continue to come from east, north, south, and west, and as the work continues to grow, we pray that we may continue to be open to the Spirit's promptings as we seek to build an intentional community, united in Christ's mission, united spiritually rather than physically. This week, as I speak to all of you who are gathered with me in real time at 12 Eastern, 11 Central, 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific, which is 6 p.m. in Europe Central Af and Central Africa, and 6 a.m. in Tahiti, I am also now, for the first time, speaking to those of you who are gathered together in real time for the late edition of Beyond the Walls. Welcome, late edition folks. For you, it's just past 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central, 4 Mountain, 3 Pacific, and it's already noon now in Tahiti. It's pretty late for people in Europe. <laughs> I invite you to uh, share together in the comments on Facebook and YouTube, where are you joining us from? For those of you participating in the late edition, Leandro is here with you live, as are our chat facilitators on the social media team, so that you can share together in real time, and on Communion Sundays, share together in the sacrament of communion. Thank you for sharing in this sacred community as spiritual heirs to the young women who came together in the 1890s who sacrificed, saved, scraped, and scrubbed to prepare a sanctuary. I hope they would be as overjoyed by the results as I am today. And now, to begin our service, we go live to Ferdale, Saskatchewan, where Jeannie Jacobson is here to read our call to worship. Jeannie, we're so happy to have you on screen on Beyond the Walls. It's nice to see you on this side of the screen. Our call to worship today is taken from section 163 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 8. The temple is an instrument of ongoing revelation in the life of the church. Its symbolism and ministries call people to reverence in the presence of the divine being. Transformative encounters with the eternal creator and reconciler await those who follow its spiritual pathways of healing, reconciliation, peace, strengthening of faith, and knowledge. There are additional sacred ministries that will spring forth from the temple as rivers of living water to help people soothe and resolve the brokenness and pain in their lives. Let the temple continue to come to life as a sacred center of worship, education, community building, and discipleship preparation for all ages. As these ministries come to fuller expression, receptive congregations in the areas around the temple and throughout the world will be revived and equipped for more effective ministry. Vital to this awakening is the understanding that the temple calls the entire church to become a sanctuary of Christ's peace, where people from all nations, ethnicities, and life circumstances can be gathered into a spiritual home without dividing walls as a fulfillment of the vision for which Jesus Christ sacrificed his life. Amen. Amen. And now I invite you to join with the Beyond the Walls Choir in singing hymn number 77, Gather Your Children. Because 
Many thanks to everyone who shares their voice with the choir and in that hymn to John Donald for the percussion. And now I'm very pleased that we go live to St. George, Utah, where Sean Matheson is here to offer our invocation. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, John. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to worship together in this Beyond the Walls online community. We love the spirit of love, compassion, inclusion, and community that we feel each week as we gather together to praise you and to share in joyful community. Gracious Lord, we seek to be one in unity in your peace. Lord, our hearts are with those who live in fear and hunger as we have so many parts of our world in war and conflict right now. We pray for your peaceful blessing, Lord, that we may be one in loving intention, unity, and consciousness. Please, Lord, bless the speakers today who will minister to us that your Holy Spirit of communion will touch our hearts through their prayerful messages. We give thanks and praise to you, Lord, and we ask that these blessings, or we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sean. And now we're very pleased that we're going around the world to tour France, where Kahelane Fa'aturai Jole is here to offer our, teach our living church lesson. Kahelane, bonjour. Bonsoir, Jean, et merci. Comment répondre aux besoins d'un membre de l'Église? Telle a été ma question durant plusieurs mois alors que je m'installais en Belgique, dans la ville de Bruxelles. Tout a commencé un soir à Bruxelles lorsque je reçois un appel téléphonique d'un jeune adulte tahitien, membre de l'église vivant en Corse. Après avoir eu une conversation avec son père, lui disant que l'église a pris position sur l'opportunité de prendre la Sainte Seine, le sacrement de la communion en ligne. Grandi sur une des îles de l'archipel des Tuamotu, une île sans montagne, avec une famille bien active et engagée au sein de l'Église. Le sacrement de la communion est un élément très important pour lui, dans sa vie, mais aussi dans son cheminement de la foi. N'ayant pas pris la Sainte Seine depuis plusieurs années, voici pour lui une bonne nouvelle de prendre part à la table du Christ en ligne. Ce symbole qui lui fait rappeler son enfance, mais aussi l'importance de son baptême et l'engagement qu'il a pris à ce moment-là. Pour lui, c'était aussi l'occasion de renouveler son alliance avec Dieu, Jésus-Christ et sa foi. Mais je m'étais rendu compte par la suite que plusieurs d'entre eux étaient dans la même situation. Plusieurs membres polynésiens avaient ce besoin énorme de renouer leur foi, mais plus particulièrement avec ce sacrement de l'Église. Et donc, nous avons au début du mois de novembre 2019 vécu notre premier service de communion en ligne. Cela a réuni plus d'une trentaine de Polynésiens de France, de Corse, mais aussi du Gabon. C'était un moment rempli d'émotions, mais aussi d'appréhension pour beaucoup d'entre eux. Prendre sa sainte scène à la maison, derrière un écran d'ordinateur ou un téléphone portable, serait-ce possible Allons-nous vivre la même expérience que nous avons vécue et grandi dans nos chapelles de Polynésie? Telles ont été les questions qu'ils se sont posées tous. Nous ne savons jamais comment l'Esprit de Dieu peut agir dans nos vies. Mais à ce moment-là, 
il y avait un esprit de fraternité, de réconciliation, d'espoir, d'amour et de paix. Ce même esprit que nous avons vécu dans nos chapelles en Polynésie, des larmes de joie et de repentance ont coulé durant ce service. Un moment de partage qui a pris un grand tournant dans la vie de ces Polynésiens vivant en Europe depuis des années. Nous avons été bénis par la présence de nos deux apôtres, Mariva Arnaud Chong et Richard Jens, qui ont été témoins de ce service. Et à partir de ce moment, nous nous sommes réunis un peu plus souvent. Nous avons commencé par un dimanche par mois, l'occasion d'offrir la Sainte Seine, puis il y a eu un service de Noël au mois de décembre 2019 avec des membres connectés en direct de Tahiti. 2020, COVID arrive et voici une belle occasion de nous réunir beaucoup plus souvent avec des activités différentes, comme le mercredi, comment vas-tu? Le vendredi, happy hour. Et tous les dimanches soirs pour le moment d'adoration. Nous avons aussi expérimenté la prière matinale à 5h30 ou 6h du matin, en fonction des saisons. Un café avec Jésus, la semaine qui suit, le dimanche de sainte seine Et tout ça, nous essayons de le faire partager en Facebook Live, comme ce soir, sur la page Facebook Communauté du Christ France. Une autre belle manière de passer le message de l'Église en France et aussi de nous faire connaître, mais aussi de rester connecté avec le monde et les followers. Nous avons mis en place un programme de mission qui se fait en live sur la page Facebook de l'Église qui s'intitule « C'est mon histoire, c'est mon chant ». Un programme où nous invitons les membres ou dirigeants de l'Église parlant français pour partager leur témoignage de Jésus-Christ au sein de la communauté du Christ. Tout ça n'aurait pas eu lieu sans la générosité d'une famille de l'Église qui a offert un budget à l'Église de France. Et nous sommes reconnaissants pour cette famille qui contribue au ministère de l'Église. Aujourd'hui, cela est devenu une belle habitude de se retrouver à chaque activité proposée. Et nous nous préparons à célébrer des sacrements d'ordination ici en France, le dernier week-end du mois de juillet, du vendredi 29 au dimanche 31, dans la belle ville de Tours, là où je vis. Ce sera l'occasion de tous nous retrouver et passer un week-end de prière, de formation, d'adoration et de partage. Il y a tellement de choses à partager avec chacun de vous, présents en direct sur Beyond the Wall. Et d'ailleurs, merci à l'équipe de nous permettre de faire partager ce message, mais aussi pour le super ministère que vous apportez à l'établissement du royaume de Dieu sur terre, Sion. Je terminerai avec ce passage de la Doctrine et Alliance, 165, 1 à B. Communauté du Christ, une vision divine vous est proposée, présentée au fil des années, à travers de nombreuses symboles et nombreuses phrases inspirées. Elle se présente aujourd'hui sous la forme d'initiative en harmonie avec la mission de Jésus-Christ. En tant que quête spirituelle, suivez avec courage les initiatives vers le cœur de la vision de Dieu pour l'Église et pour la création. Puis, en réponse à une compréhension croissante de la nature et de la volonté de Dieu, continuez à façonner des communautés qui vivent l'amour et la mission du Christ.
Que Dieu vous bénisse tous. Et merci pour rendre la mission vibrante du Christ et vivante dans nos vies. Amen. Amen. And welcome everyone once again. Well, once again, I know that some of you are here again with us. I saw you this morning and it's such a blessing to be with you again. Um, I have an assistant here who's helping me keep track of all those who have said um, hello. I have Catherine, I have Elle um, Young from Oregon, I have Barbara, hello Barbara from Wisconsin and Laura, and I have uh, Eunice Strangways, and I have uh, our Charles Kincaid, I think I saw you too in, at, at noon, Charles, and on, that's YouTube, and on, on Facebook we have Raymond uh, in Odessa, Texas, we have uh, Mavis, we have Alan, we have Isabel, one of our singers, we have Ibong uh, from Uganda, welcome, we, we have Wanda Mercer, I saw you at noon as well, welcome back Wanda. And we have Sharon, and we have Ellen, and we have uh, Bill, another one who I've seen a lot of you today. It's a blessing. And we also have Kirsten from Michigan. Thank you so much to help us once again build this sanctuary all uh, together at noon and also here and in our late edition. And as always, um, I'm gonna remind you that one of the ways in which we build the sanctuary, especially now that we are just getting started building this late edition sanctuary is to click like and also to share this video. That's how social media works. Uh, that's how we spread the word. That's how we invite people to Christ. Uh, so thank you so much for clicking like, for sharing. Uh, that's mission. And so for that mission, for that invitational um, ministry, as always, I want to thank you. Comme toujours. Je vous remercie y como siempre les doy las gracias. Y sigan diciendo hola, eh. I would love to uh, read your your names and your places. So keep telling us hi if you haven't yet. Thank you. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you, Mike. In my opening remarks, I told a story from the history of the Toronto congregation. From the 19th century to the present, the congregation has continued through an unbroken line of faithful stewards, disciples who have continued to sacrifice their time, talents, and treasure to further Christ's mission to build up God's inclusive, just, and peaceable kingdom here in Toronto and throughout the earth. Today we celebrate with one of those disciples the most senior member of the Toronto congregation, Olive Firm McLaughry Wilby. Olive celebrates her 100th birthday tomorrow on May 23rd, 2022. Olive was born here in Toronto in 1922, and so her early life overlapped with the later lives of the women who founded the congregation in the 1890s. We have a picture of the congregation standing in front of the old Soho Street Church that dates to 1923, a year after Olive was born. She may even be in the picture, albeit obscured from view somewhere being held by her mother. Olive was baptized in 1931 by J. Leslie Prentice, who was pastor at that time, the 13th pastor of the Toronto congregation. She was confirmed as a member of the church that same day by Ben H. Hewitt, who afterward became the 14th pastor of the congregation. We can see here all of the children and young women in the congregation in 1933. And if we zoom in, you can see Olive McLachlan, uh, later Olive will be at the age of 11 here at the Bathurst Street Church in 1933. She later married 
Alfred William Wilby in 1946. And although it's been many years since Olive was able to attend services in person, she has continued to be in the congregation's regular prayers. Uh, I know her very well from the praying on her behalf. For many years as well, Chuck Boyd, who is the 38th pastor of the congregation, took communion to her home. She now lives in a nursing home in Shelburne, where the mother of one of our members, Melanie Leach, also lives, which allows Melanie to visit. And of course, Olive is also connected to us through her son, Dan. Dan lives here in Toronto and is a member of the congregation. So thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Dan. As we celebrate her century on earth, all of us in the congregation today are so thankful to Olive and all of our most senior members. You prepared the sanctuary that welcomed us. Your discipleship has become our model as we seek to prepare an inviting sanctuary for those who will be our spiritual successors in this community. And now I invite you to sit, join with the Beyond the Walls Choir in singing hymn number 344, Creator of the Intertwined. And now we go live to Eiselstein in the Netherlands, where Lee Mitchell is here to read our lectionary scripture. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, John. Our lectionary text today comes from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Now, the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent that the Lord, and not any mortal, has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. 
Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who, who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. Amen. Amen. Now I'm very pleased that we're going live to Boise, Idaho, where our own Evan Charlie is here to offer today's message. Evan, we're really happy to have you sharing ministry with Beyond the Walls. Hi, John. It's always good to be here. 2020 was a harrowing year for all of us. Many of us lost jobs, homes, and our sense of safety. My 2020 was a year of highs and lows. My wife and I got married at the end of February in a beautiful ceremony surrounded by many of our friends and family. It was like a fairy tale and a day I will never forget. However, just a couple of weeks later, we moved in with my mother-in-law who was dying of cancer. Together, the three of us watched as the world fell apart while our own personal worlds also fell apart. During this time, I was so stressed out and had very few places where I could express how I was feeling and have people help me through it. It was overwhelming. However, there were a couple of places that I was able to find that sanctuary that I desperately needed. Twice a month, the Forward with Community congregation hosted Zoom meetups and we were able to talk about what was going on in our lives. It was lovely being able to talk to the same folks week after week and forge friendships with them. I talked about what was going on in my life and what was going on in theirs. I also found that the Beyond the Walls congregation was eager to start meetups like this as well. And so I committed to running a discussion group every Thursday. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, verse eight, we are counseled to become a sanctuary and a spiritual home for all nations, ethnicities, and life circumstances. We are to embody Christ's peace by helping facilitate healing, reconciliation, peace, strengthening of faith, and learning. The people that I have met at these meetups have taken that counsel to heart. I was given support and love through that emotionally strenuous time in my life, and I have now had the privilege of helping others through similar experiences. After my experiences over the last two years, I am now a firm believer in the benefits of preparing sanctuaries, communities, like the ones we have been building. Community building has become such an important aspect of my life that I wanted to try and express some of the benefits that being a part of one brings. I could speak for hours about each of these benefits, but I've been told that I only have a couple of minutes to speak to you today. So I would like to touch on a total of four topics. The first is support and safety, which is the first benefit uh, that I experienced and already talked to you about. The second is influence and learning. The third is sharing and caring. And the fourth is love and acceptance. Communities are usually built around common interests, but are often far from homogenous. There is an Eastern parable that I love to tell and I would like to relate it again to you today. It is called the blind men and the elephant. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. Out of curiosity, they said we must inspect and understand it by touching it. So they sought it out and touched it. The first man touched the trunk and said an elephant is like a thick snake. The second man touched its ear and said, an elephant is like a fan. The third man touched the leg and said, an elephant is like a tree trunk. 
The fourth man touched the side and said, an elephant is like a wall. And the fifth man touched the tusk and said, an elephant is like a spear. This parable then has two endings. In the first ending, the blind men are distrusting of each other and they all suspect the other of lying about their experiences. They argue amongst themselves until they end up in a fist fight over their different understandings. In the second ending, the blind men stop talking and start listening to each other. They come to understand that all of them had a unique perspective on the same thing, and none of them were lying when they gave their different descriptions. Through this, they were able to piece together the information that they had and have a clearer understanding of something that they only knew a part of before. Our communities often work in the same way. In Community of Christ, we celebrate unity and diversity. We recognize that there is a diversity of thought. We all have our hand touching different parts of the elephant. In our community, we have decided that we would rather learn from one another's understanding instead of imposing our own onto others. This simple yet enduring principle creates communities which encourages people to be exactly the divine and valuable being that God created them to be. This brings us to the next benefit, sharing and caring. There are a couple of different kinds of sharing that I'd like to talk about wants and needs. I have a couple of examples of how members of my community have given both of these to me. For those who know me, I am a huge fan of the history of the Restoration. I love learning about all of the cousin sects, but especially have fallen in love with learning about the history of Community of Christ. As I dug further and further into our history, I came to a point where I started reading the source code of our history which are old Herald articles and resolutions that we've written, sometimes over 150 years ago. Whenever I ran into a dead end in my historical research, I could always count on two people to help me find the answer, Twyla Ryder and Rachel Killebrew. These women are unparalleled in leaving no stone unturned in regards to Community of Christ history, and I am thankful that they are willing to help look for the information that I want whenever I ask them. <laughs> Additionally, a community is willing to share to fulfill your needs. My estranged father passed away this past February. I held his hand as he took his last breath. And not even an hour later, my community moved heaven and earth to take me to lunch. They shared their time and money to support me and let me grieve in one of the most harrowing moments of my life. I desperately needed the support that they were eager to give me. Additionally, John and Leandro from Beyond the Walls Congregation listened to me vent for hours to them that week. I am so thankful for all the care that my community gave me in that time of need. The last benefit I would like to touch on today is love and acceptance. Christ, the man that we call God, had an odd way of doing things. People were expecting the Messiah to be a militaristic king, but instead we got a poor working class man. People were expecting only the most well-respected and pious to be his chosen, but instead he associated himself with the outcast and marginalized. People were expecting someone who would convict, but instead he forgave. In short, Christ's ministry was marked by unconditional love and acceptance to everyone who needed it. Today, we face many of the same challenges that Christ's time did. Today, would Christ want our religious leaders to be presidents and prime ministers or school teachers and retail workers? Today, would Christ be sitting in pews and be bragging about how great his church is? Or would he be supporting a transgender woman who is alienated by that church? Today, would Christ condemn you for your shortcomings or forgive you and encourage you to learn and grow from them? I believe that Christ would embody acceptance today, just as he did then. 
Yet, as 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, we are all a part of the body of Christ. We are called to be his hands and feet. Embodying this love and acceptance is a lofty responsibility, but it's one that many of us have already committed to strive towards. However, all is not well in Zion. Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, verse 3b through 3c, counsels and warns us. Above all else, strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceful kingdom of God on earth. Courageously challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God. Pursue peace. There are subtle yet powerful influences in the world, some even claiming to represent Christ, that seek to divide people and nations to accomplish their destructive aims. That which seeks to harden one human heart against another by constructing walls of fear and prejudice is not of God. Be especially alert to these influences, lest they divide you or divert you from the mission to which you are called. Because of this, as a member of the body of Christ, I need to take a moment and challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that I have seen in my life. The past several years have been extraordinarily difficult for the transgender community. In politics, many states have passed transphobic laws which are fundamentally humiliating and dehumanizing. Many religious circles stoke hatred and fear and spread misunderstanding. Transphobia is completely incompatible with the teachings of Christ. Those who distort the peaceful one to become the hateful one have truly made God in their own image and they need to put away this false idol. If you are transgender, then you are a creation of the divine and thus are sacred. You are worthy of love, acceptance, and full inclusion in our communities and sanctuaries for being exactly who you are. Not only this, you have a unique and valuable insight which only enriches our diversity and understanding. I am thankful that you are here with us, not only today in this service, but also with us in our human family. The benefits that these meaningful and inclusive sanctuaries can bring are self-evident. They encourage you to grow while also accepting you for who you are. We are able to support each other through the hard times and celebrate with each other during the good times. As we begin a new week, I encourage you to reach out to someone in your community that you haven't talked to in a while and see how they are doing and if there's anything that you can do for them. Communities which take care of people like this are life-saving sanctuaries. We are called to prepare these sanctuaries for all nations, ethnicities, and life circumstances. We are to embody Christ's peace by helping facilitate healing, reconciliation, peace, strengthening of faith, and learning. Thank you for listening, my family and friends. Thanks again, Evan. And I invite you all now to uh, take a moment to meditate on this message. Um, and to take a moment also to prepare an inner sanctuary. This is a space where we can feel at ease, at peace, a place where we can find refuge, balance and happiness, beauty health, calm, comfort, love. Of course, as always, the first step 
for any meditation is to start breathing deeply and slowly and to relax the body, shoulders especially, the jaw, and to bring your attention to the present moment and that constant flow of breath in and out of your lungs. I am very certain that you have already experienced this inner sanctuary that experiences is so, so common that maybe you've been there many times, but sometimes you never really realized you were there or you were just there for an instant. I invite you to relive this experience, and by that I mean trying to reconnect with the way you felt at that moment so that we can find ways to walk into this inner temple, inner sanctuary, anytime darkness grows like shadows, like clouds around us. And let's use the power of our imagination Sometimes it's for us adults, imagination is a little rusty. We were much better at it when we were kids, but still there. So if it helps, close your eyes, breathe, follow my voice, and if not, you can watch uh, the pictures that you'll see on screen, and that might help you relive those experiences. So relax, continue breathing, bring yourself to this moment right here and right now. And with the eye of the mind, just picture a safe place, a place where you would go to feel safe, or maybe a place you think about, you dream about when you seek a sensation of peace and calm. It might be a memory of places, circumstances, long ago when you were a kid. Places that made you feel loved and safe. And it can be a real place or an imaginary place like a white marble temple on a mountain top above the clouds or an island in the middle of an endless sea, a lodge in the middle of an endless forest. And welcome also in this picture people who make you feel safe and at ease. Who are those people with whom you can experience these positive emotions, feelings? It can be people who are alive today or deceased. You can welcome them either way. Even people who probably never existed, like a character in a book of scripture or a work of literature, or angels, beautiful angels with human bodies and feathered wings who are there watching over you, protecting you. Bring them in, into this safe space, into this inner sanctuary. And try to imagine with colors, with sounds, with smells, sensations on your skin that may put you at ease. 
bring them all into this inner sanctuary. Continue breathing. And if that feels too hard to do, just consider an activity that brings you peace, brings you a sense of calm, of perhaps a passage of scripture that comforts you. Let that be your inner sanctuary and continue breathing Bring in yourself, your whole being, mind and body and, and soul, into this inner place of safety, of healing. The inner sanctuary exists in the present moment, in the present instant. That inner sanctuary is in that space of time when you're done exhaling before you take the next breath in. That eternal instant where past and future cannot enter. Because past and future do not enter in the sanctuary. They cannot shake it. And since they cannot shake it, now that you're safe, consider th those things that disturb your sense of safety. As you breathe in and out, just watch for thoughts and feelings and notice if there's Anything that you might be trying to get away from, hide away from. Why do you think you're seeking refuge in this place? Is there anything you, you're afraid of? Is there something in this sanctuary Something that brings you comfort, that you can take with you when you face the challenges outside the safety space of this meditation. This holy space is always at hand. It is within you and all around you. Yet, it is very hard to see, very hard to feel, very hard to enter indeed. This inner holy of holies is one, one in space, one in time, one for all. There is only one holy space. And we follow the Spirit like a wind that always blows in the direction of this holy space, like a river always flowing towards the sea. So go forth now, this week that is about to start, bring in this inner sanctuary wherever you go, sharing with the world the blessings of your inner sanctuary with every word that you say and every decision you make and every interaction you have with every person on your journey. Because everyone belongs to this space. Everyone is welcome in this holy place.
Thank you, and thanks once again to the Beyond the Walls Choir. Go forth with the admonition found in the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 through 24. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure, washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and do good deeds. Amen. Stay with us after the postlude. All of our ministers today are members of our Beyond the Walls teams, and so we'll check in with them and talk to them about how the service comes to being. Thank you. 
Thanks everyone for sharing with us this first ever late edition of our Sunday service of our Beyond the Walls. I would like to say hello, welcome to those of you who I missed on uh, my first global welcome. So this is a late, late global welcome. I would love to say hi to Twyla Ryder and Anthony Smith and Jamie Carson Cantrell, and also to Karen Lee, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Music Merritt, and Rick Collins, and Leonard Warnock. Oh, and also Sue Wakefield, who's uh, sharing with us now. Thank you so much, folks. Uh, what a blessing to be with you. With some of you, it's been a long day uh, that we've been together. It's wonderful. Please uh, help us. Spread the word. Let us invite um, folks to this uh, to this service to, so that we can have a, a community experience. Uh, now that so many of us are going back to in-person services and we cannot uh, participate in the early edition. So thanks again for that ministry. Have a nice weekend. Um, have a nice week. And to those of you in Canada, happy Victoria Day. Bye now.